Hello everybody, it's the Historical Gamer once again, and today we're returning to Grand Tactician, The Civil War. It's been a little while since the last time we've taken a look at this game. Uh, the last time we did look at this, uh, the game had recently just entered Early Access. It was a little bit more rough in terms of the state that it was in. Since our last uh, look at this game, uh, there have been several updates that have come out that are supposed to have improved the performance of the AI. Additionally, they've added a new campaign. So as you may recall, uh, the, original the original early access game shipped with an 1861 and 62 campaign. The 63 campaign either came out then or very shortly after. Uh, but the 1861 campaign that, that came out with the early access version of the game uh, was the spring of 1861. So or actually the winter of 1861. So Fort Sumter hadn't been fired upon. Uh, no armies really had been raised yet. There were a few troops that were in some scattered forts. It was really about having, you know, the Union and the Confederates sort of manage that very early period in the conflict uh, when neither side had yet really started shooting and when a lot of the forts in the South were still occupied by federal troops, but there really wasn't much of a federal army uh, to enforce the, the policy and the will of Abraham Lincoln as the Southern states attempted to secede. The border states hadn't left yet, uh, and other items like that. The summer of 1861 campaign, which is the newest of the campaigns which just come out, is basically the Bull Run campaign. So. Uh, the campaign starts in July of 1861. Uh, the Union has already raised 75,000 soldiers, the Confederates 50,000 soldiers. The Union Navy is beginning the process of building up for a blockade. And there have been a couple of small skirmishes that have been fought in Carthage, Missouri, uh, the Philippi, Philippi races in Western Virginia, uh, and the Battle of Big Bethel, I believe, near Fort Monroe uh, on the peninsula in Virginia. Fort Sumter obviously has already been fired upon, and Fort Pickens is still in the hands of the Union. And so that's the situation right now in July of 1861. We're going to start a new campaign, uh, playing through that campaign, and see how things go. We're also going to play as the Union. I know that gives us a bit of an advantage, but I'm really curious to see you know, how the Confederacy defends against the Union, if they're able to fight better in tactical battles. I imagine the fights in the East, for example, will be relatively close in terms of manpower and numbers. So there should be some troops raised, so it's not going to be all on the AI to build their armies from scratch, but they're definitely not big enough yet. So it's kind of giving, giving us a chance to look at, like, if the AI has something built already, but it's not enough to fight a really long conflict, is it able to, you know, ramp up and build up and, and build an effective force to counter us? Or is it just going to be us building troops and rapidly overtaking the AI? So that's what we'll see here in a few moments, but I'm going to go ahead and jump right in. And uh, I'll skip through the, the narration video of sort of chapter one, or, or maybe it's chapter two now, um, of the sort of voice narration. And we'll just jump right to the, to the campaign map. All right, and so we're into the main screen after sort of the intro video. Uh, you can see we've got the uh, newspaper pop-up giving us information about what's going on. Uh, it's letting us know that further states are seceding, volunteers are flooding city halls, the Confederate armies are on the move. Uh, so far, Europe is reluctant to take side. Uh, chapter 2 is the Demons of War, I believe, so it's just kind of telling us we've started Chapter 2, uh, and the war essentially has begun. So... There's that. How do I get rid of this newspaper? There we go. Um, so here we go. We've got the map of the entire United States as of the, the period of time during the American Civil War. Obviously excluding California, the West Coast, uh, the Arizona territories, where there was some but minimal campaigning that occurred in the war. You can see the Confederacy is in control of pretty much all of their historical sort of states that seceded. Um, there's a few exceptions. The Union has troops on Fort Monroe on the tip of the, is it the James Peninsula? We've got the Fort Monroe garrison uh, down here. Uh, we've got a total of 4,000 troops. Uh, the fort is in excellent condition. Benjamin Butler is in command there. If we move down here, we can see we do have blockading squadrons uh, off of the Atlantic coast, but we don't really have anywhere to base them from yet. 
Um, so, you know, taking a port like Port Royal uh, would be pretty useful. Uh, it would allow us to have a base on the uh, east coast of the Confederacy if we could put a garrison down there, uh, and that would allow us to more effectively blockade Charleston, Savannah. Port Royal was one of the best anchorages on the American East Coast uh, at this time, and the Union Navy did take it early in the war, so that's something that we'll have to take a look at and consider uh, doing. We've also got a Gulf blockading squadron as well. We have some other items down here on the bottom of the map to Mexico, to Nicaragua, Cuba, Britain, France, uh, which sort of represent shipping lanes between all these different countries that are, that are represented off map, but ships can uh, move into them. And yeah, so we've got sort of squadrons all along there. You can see obviously here that uh, Mexico is on the map as well. Um, these items don't seem to be clickable. I think they must be like off-map items, uh, but it doesn't really explain to me what they are. Again, I'm assuming they're trade. So you might move like a blockade runner or a commerce raider or those items onto those screens to transit to those locations. Again, that's just my assumption. Um, so what are we going to do right now? What are we going to do first? Well, we can see here that we've got armies raising in and around Washington and north of the Shenandoah Valley. We don't really have much in the way of armies sort of in, in the center of the, the country. We don't have any armies in Kentucky yet. The lack of troops in Kentucky would be historical. You know, this is a period where Kentucky is still claiming itself as neutral and pretending that it can stay out of the conflict. And so both sides initially anyway did try to uh, try to respect that to lure Kentucky to their side. The Confederates would eventually violate that neutrality to take a key strategic position in and around Columbus along the Mississippi River, uh, but that, that hasn't happened yet, so right now those maps are still empty. Uh, we do have one army in Missouri near Springfield under Nathaniel Lyon and his 5,600 men. Uh, this was the army that would fight the Battle of uh, Wilson Creek, I believe it was. Uh, and then we also have some troops in uh, sort of east, or I guess eastern Oklahoma uh, under Major Taddeus Grace. Only about 50 men um, currently sort of sitting down there. Uh, they'll, they'll get gobbled up pretty quick down there, I would imagine. Uh, meanwhile, you can see we have $1.9 million in the bank. We're spending $6.9 million by the looks of it. Uh, and we have 141,000 manpower, I'm guessing, 180 potential seaport capacity. We're not using any of it. Riverine transport capacity is 233. We're not using any of that. And railroad transport capacity is 121. And we're not using any of that right now. If we go ahead and we zoom in... Let's see here. Um, is there anything we want to do for Nathaniel Lyon's army? Probably raise more troops, ideally sooner rather than later. That's a pretty small army. Um, let's see here. So we've got four brigades and an artillery battery that is currently serving under him. Uh, we could go ahead and we could add a new group. So we could we could add some divisions under his army um, if we if we want to do that. Uh, so we could put the entire sort of first group of, of his troops in a division. So I think my plan here is going to be to uh, divide this army into two divisions and to have sort of two brigades and one artillery piece in each division. Uh, I, I'm struggling a little bit with the UI here. What you want to do is you can just barely see it when I select a brigade, but there's like a little downward arrow on the division component, and so you want to hover and drop it over that. Uh, if you drop it below that, for whatever reason, it doesn't register it, but you can see there I figured it out there just as an FYI. I think each division will have two brigades of infantry and one battery of artillery, so we're not going to increase the Army of the West dramatically. Uh, but we will look to increase it in size. So the first division is going to be under Brigadier General Archibald McDougall. Uh, we could replace him as well with someone maybe more suited or someone who I who I actually know. Um, I'm not sure who that would be right now. Uh, do we have like Franz Sigal or something like that? John MacArthur, John McLaren. So I'm not entirely clear if these are ranks based off of you know, uh, an officer's 
rank in the regular army or if they're ranks based off of their sort of becoming major generals of volunteers or brigadier generals of volunteers. Because in the Civil War, you got a temporary rank to command volunteer units, but that didn't translate into the regular army because the U.S. regular army was much smaller. So it was, it's a very interesting thing where like generals would be promoted in the regular army. They'd be a brigadier general or something like that. Uh, Meade was a major general of volunteers when the Battle of Gettysburg happened, but he was promoted afterwards to a brigadier general in the regular army is sort of a, a reward for winning the battle of Gettysburg. And it's this big thing because it's this permanent rank that when the war ends, that's what your pension's going to be at. That's what your pay is going to be at, uh, as opposed to everybody else who's just going to revert to the regular army rank at the conclusion of the war. It's a little bit confusing how the rank is handled in the game because it's clear. Like, I don't think I'm pretty certain there were very few major generals or brigadier generals at this time. So like John Pope isn't a brigadier general uh, in the regular army at this time. But he is a brigadier general in the game, but then like you've also got other officers like Henry Hunt, uh, who's still a captain, or um, some of the other officers are even lower ranked or like majors or captains at this point. And I'm not, it's hard to keep track of who was where when at this point in the war. Um, but, but anyway, that's why like, especially in this early period of, of the game, it's a little bit challenging to find the officers you want to put in the commands that you want to put them in because so many of the higher ranking folks are folks who didn't amount to anything in the war because they quickly got, you know, dropped or de demoted or, or not demoted, but removed from positions of, of, of relevance. And I think it's, it's interesting, but it also leads you to a lot of these sort of randomly selected officers at the top ranks. Um, okay, so we've got one brigade here, one brigade here. They are three-month recruits also, which could be a problem, actually. Maybe we don't want to raise too many troops right now. Um, actually, speaking of that, what, where are we start Before I get into the Army management, I really should be taking a look here. So we've got Winfield Scott still in command of the Union Army. Uh, we've got, it claims 141,000 men fielded. Um, I don't think we have that many troops in service, but maybe that's how many have been recruited. Uh, if we go to the military, we're, we'll look at that later. Finances here, you can see uh, our revenues and taxes, the status of the economy, all of this stuff. I'm not really going to fiddle with any of that. You know, I really should spend some time looking through each of these different screens. Um, I'm not really going to do that in this, in this episode, but we will dive into the policies here. Uh, so the policy screen is a screen where you can choose different diplomatic policies that will have different impacts on the war. You can have up to eight policies that you're using at any one time. Uh, currently, we have two selected. We've got the three-month volunteer uh, selection, uh, and I believe we've got um, uh, an industrialization item selected, uh, as well as sort of military one selected. So I'm going to go ahead and spend some points uh, selecting our 12-month Militia Act, which allows us to recruit uh, troops for up to 12 months. Uh, so those three-month soldiers under Nathaniel Lyons will be able to stick around for, for 12 months instead. Um when, for new units that you raise, the existing units have to follow the, the rules they already have. We're also going to go with Diplomacy 1 and Food Basket 1. Food Basket or, or, or Agriculture uh, is uh, it's the icon's Food Basket, but Agriculture is focused on sort of you know strengthening Union Agriculture, which was important in terms of our relations with Europe. Uh, the Diplomacy 1 is important with regards to our relations with Europe as well, so keeping them out of the war. And then we also did select the Monetary Policy number 1, which is important with regards to to uh, being able to fund the war and raise more troops. Again, you can select up to eight policies. You can progress down a tech tree without using another policy, but you can only have sort of eight policies within a given tech tree at any one time. Um, I'll dive more into that in future episodes when we really get into looking at the economy, looking in at all of these different screens. There's a lot of depth. There's a lot of information in these screens. I'm not really going to look at it in this video. What we're going to do in this video is we're just going to kind of go right to the to the front. Okay, we don't have a ton of troops in the center of the, of the of the theaters raised yet. We have some in West Virginia. We have some in Missouri. But let's look at the Virginia front. Let's basically fight the uh, Bull Run campaign and see if we can't just you know snuff out this rebellion uh, before we have to worry about all that uh, economic gobbledygook. So right now we've got uh, several armies in and around Washington. We've got the Army of Northern Virginia under Major General McDowell. It's 32,000 soldiers. And we're going to march it south just to uh, directly to Manassas to see if we can't engage uh, the Confederate Army of the Potomac uh, at Manassas Junction. Meanwhile, while we do that with that army, we're also going to take the Department of the 
uh, the Department of Pennsylvania under Major General Robert Patterson, his 18,000 soldiers are going to march on Winchester against the Army of the Shenandoah. Uh, the Army of the Shenandoah has Joseph E. Johnston, if, if we're following history anyway, has Joseph E. Johnston commanding. So I'm going to do a simultaneous advance in both uh, the eastern portion of Virginia on the Army of the Potomac and in the western portion of Virginia down the valley against Joseph E. Johnston. Hopefully by moving these two forces simultaneously, we will prevent either one of them from being able to reinforce the other and we'll be able to overwhelm them uh, with superior numbers. And this is sort of, in theory, Patterson was supposed to pin Johnston in place in the Shenandoah. He did not do that, and Johnston was able to send substantial reinforcements to PG2 Beauregard, who's in command of the Army of the Potomac. Uh, if I move both my officers in tandem, I'm hoping that we can prevent that. So with that being said, uh, let's go ahead and unpause the game and let's see how things develop. Uh, once we get those sort of call-outs that the uh, items that we selected, the policies that we selected, uh, have sort of unlocked, uh, then we can also look at raising more troops. But you can see here the troops are moving now, so uh, it, at least it looks like they're moving. Slowly. I believe they're moving. Yep, they're marching ever so slowly. You can see here it, the, the supply situation is currently 100%. 49 guns, 48 troops of 32,000 are disabled. If we want to go ahead and pull up the army menu here, we can see our army is broken into uh, five divisions. Uh, we've got at least two brigades in each division. One of the brigades, or two of the brigades have additional, or two of the divisions have extra brigades. Uh, the first division having uh, two extra brigades. The first division, is that under Sykes? No, that's under T Tyler, Daniel Tyler. Um, and then we've also got four batteries of artillery moving with that force. I don't feel the need, as long as we move quickly, I don't really feel the need to reinforce them all that much. Um, I think we'll just sort of get these guys marching, and, and hopefully the Department of the Pens of, of the Pen Pennsylvania is moving as well. It does look like they are. Things are moving a little bit slowly, though. We've got five hours of, of action here so far. The troops in Pennsylvania really aren't moving down the valley at all. Uh, meanwhile, the Army of the Potomac is crossing, or the Army of Northern Virginia, sorry, is crossing, uh, Northeastern Virginia, is crossing the Potomac here. We'll speed things up to times two, and we'll probably be in a battle here before too long. Uh, okay, there's an arm. There is an engagement. The Army of the Potomac is in contact with the Army of Northeastern Virginia. What are your orders? I want to play the battle. So we have options here. We can play the battle, auto resolve, deploy to defend. That means the enemy is not offering battle if you don't attack. Order your unit to deploy to defend and hold the enemy at bay. We can order a withdraw or a retreat. I'm going to go ahead and play the battle, uh, and we will see how things play out. It is the Battle of Alexandria, Virginia, so it looks like we met a little bit further north of Manassas on July 8th, 1861. After initial skirmishing and maneuvering, the opposing armies are deploying for battle. So I know we didn't really dive a whole lot into the economics or the, the grand strategy of the campaign yet. Um, you know, I didn't really see the need to. We've got the army ready. Uh, we're ready to fight the, the Battle of Manassas, and we'll see how things go. Uh, you can see here we outnumber the Confederates pretty heavily. It looks like the Confederates have 19,000 soldiers under Be Beauregard. Uh, and this claims, anyway, that would have, we have 51,000 men under General Major General McDowell. That may be because we're close enough to, to Washington to get some of those fortification troops uh, to march to the sound of the guns. Uh, I guess we'll see here. Um, so our objectives here, our army will vigorously attack the enemy in the region of Virginia. We are facing the Army of the Potomac under P Gen or Commander PG-2 Beauregard with a strength of 19,000 men and 28 guns. The enemy army is green and the morale is reported to be uh, confident. Reports indicate their supply situation is outstanding. The supply situation of our own army is outstanding. General Robert Patterson. A little bit confused here. Isn't Patterson in the valley? So this little bit is... Uh a trifle bit confusing because when I go into like the actual army organization of, of battle, if you will, Robert Patterson's army information comes up as well as uh, Irvin McDowell's army information. It almost seems like Patterson ranks McDowell and Patterson is in the field with McDowell. But that's not accurate because I only have McDowell's divisions, his five divisions or so of the army of northeastern Virginia that are on the field. 
Uh, which to me, I, I think the reason it's doing that is is the two armies are actually in the command radius of each other. If we go back to the campaign map, we'd see these blue circles and they overlap with each other, but they're not really close. So there's sort of an inner and an outer circle. And the inner circle would basically mean like if the two armies are within that radius, they'll fight immediately together. The outer circle, I believe, represents like in theory, the army could come to my aid, and if the battle lasts two, three, four days or something like that, those troops may show up as reinforcements. But I don't understand why it would include them here if they're not in the battle now. It would make much more sense if it only includes them when they show up on the field of battle. Not sure why it does that, but it seems to do that. So it's a little bit, a little bit confusing. Uh, in any event, that's sort of the explanation for my clicking around and being a little bit confused here, is because I was, I was playing and I was like, "What the heck, Patterson isn't there?" But, but I kind of looked into it, and, and that appears to be the reason why. We need to touch Oak Forest and the Warrentown Turnpike. Those objectives are more for the AI. Our primary objective is to destroy the enemy army. So we've got Ambrose Burnside. Where is where are you, McDowell? All right, McDowell, you're down here. So move the entire force down here. I don't see any any troops under Patterson. If we zoom in here, I don't see Patterson at all. So maybe he could like come to reinforce us, perhaps. But it doesn't seem like he's here right now. All right, so McDowell is in position and then I think what we're gonna do is to keep our army sort of consolidated I'm really just gonna go right at him I'm gonna march down Centerville I'm gonna move west to the Warrentown Turnpike and I'm gonna cross at the stone bridge and we'll take the casualties moving across that bridge if we need to uh, and we'll we'll just try and, and win this thing just you know by going going head head first right at him so in that in that uh, vein let's go ahead and send the second division under Dixon S miles over here uh, toward the stone bridge We will send the 1st Division under Daniel Tyler to guard Ball Ford to the south uh, and the flank of the troops moving on the, on the Stone Bridge. We will send David Hunter's 3,400 men toward Farm Ford. They're a little bit smaller of a division. They'll be guarding the right flank of that 1st Division under Dixon Miles. And then we'll send the 3rd Division under Samuel Heinzelman. They'll be in reserve here. They're, they're the biggest division. We have 9,000 men uh, on War the Warrentown Turnpike. And then Theodore uh, Runyon, uh, his 5,700 men, will also back up at the Stone Bridge. They're going to cross with the, with the first group of troops. So you can see here the enemy currently has Henry Hill occupied. That's the only indication of where their troops are at this time. And we're underway. So it is 1,900 hours, so our troops arrived in the evening. So I'm not sure we'll get any fighting done today uh, because by the time our troops march into position, the sun will be down. I mean, it's already 7 o'clock, so the sun's kind of already down, but you can see our troops are moving. You can see the couriers are on the way to the 3rd Division to tell it to start moving, and other couriers on the way to the, uh, the division on the far end of the line, the 4th Division, to get it moving. Uh, and we'll, we'll just march as much as we can before the, the day-end trigger comes. And then we'll we'll attack them in the morning. I would guess. What time does does it tell me what time the sun goes down? It just says it's eighty four degrees and sunny. First day of the battle. So we'll go ahead and move at times four speed as these troops begin to follow the roads and march into position here. I don't have any cavalry by the by the way. It doesn't look like we have any horsemen to support us. And uh, away we go. I think I have the music turned off. Mainly just to prevent like copyright strikes and things like that on YouTube if, if the music isn't licensed. I can't remember if it is, but I know I turned the music off for a reason. All right, so these troops are moving. And I think we can probably go times 10 speed since there's nothing, no enemy troops that are uh, that are in the way. Our troops are marching sort of cross lots. It doesn't look like these guys are following a roadway. They're just sort of marching along the side of this... Uh, this mountain range. Centerville's taken by our troops. I'm not sure we got to hold troops in Centerville or not. I mean, again, it doesn't really matter all that much. It's more about destroying the enemy in battle. So you can see Heinzelman and his guns are now moving down the Warrentown Turnpike, which is a great road. You can see the speed of the troops picks up substantially when they make it along a good road. 
the Warrentown Turnpike being a major road here. From the altitude, it almost looks like a river. It does look like a river. That's weird. But it's a McKenna, whatever, like a stone pike, basically. So those troops are making good time. There's going to be a bit of a traffic jam here by the looks of it as these troops all start filing into the end of the roadway here. We're a little bit strung out, but our troops are moving. Uh, meanwhile, the enemy appears to still be around Henry House. No indication that they're uh, at the uh, at the stone bridge. Darkness has fallen, so we'll go ahead and uh, cease our turn. It'll resupply our troops, but for the most part, everybody should have full, full ammunition here. I mean, we haven't shot at the enemy yet. It does show we get 27% resupply for some of these units. Looks like their provisions are at 27% resupply. First Brigade, meanwhile, some of these lead brigades aren't getting resupplied. Do they have provisions? 0% provisions, huh. Well, they can go a day without, uh, without food. All right, so now we can deploy these guys, I guess, which basically just gives me a free march. So let's go ahead and take this first division here under Daniel Tyler and put it up by the stone bridge. You can see by moving them forward like that, we did detect some Confederate troops opposite of the bridge. Uh, we'll take the second division, move them up here near um, the farm ford up here. There are 3,400 troops overlooking that ford to the north. We will take the fourth division under Theodore Runyon's and move them down near Lewis Ford. Two brigades, but a good number of troops down there. We will take Heinzelman's Corps and move them in reserve of the Stone Bridge. Uh, the 5th Division Artillery. Uh, no, I want the 5th Division. 5th Division, I guess we'll put them down by Balls Ford. Does that just leave McDowell? I think I can move McDowell, right? Ah. Oh. Damn it. I know there's an update coming that's going to allow you to move your headquarters commanders. So, like, I'd be able to, in theory, move um, McDowell independent of you moving the entire army, I believe. I think I saw an update about that. But for the, for the present, I don't think I can do that. All right, so we'll deploy our troops for the next morning's fight, day two of the battle, really day one of the battle. We didn't we didn't fight at all. Okay. So we're going to be starting the next day. Nobody's entrenching or anything like that. All right. So we are now in position. We've spotted enemy brigades here. Uh, but it doesn't look like they're going to contest us moving up over Stone Bridge, so let's do it. Let's move these troops immediately over these fords and bridges. Get them into position to assault the enemy wherever they may be. Heinzelman's 9,000 are going to go across Lewis Ford. Runyon is going to move in behind them, but he's going to cross at Balls Ford. Tyler's 9,000. So actually we have two divisions of 9,000 men are going to wait for Hunter to clear and Miles is going to cross at Farm Ford. All right, so if we zoom down here, we can see morning is coming up. These troops, what does this say here? First battle experience. Otherwise they've got positive traits here. So the fatigue is rested, the cohesion is intact, and the training is good. This, that seems a little favorable to uh, troops at Bull Run. But their status is idle, uh, cover none, good melee, um, confident morale. So Centerville... Okay. Supply trains reached all of the units, and the supply level is 100 out of 100. You'll find the details in the consolidated report. Thank you for the quartermaster report there. That's good news. Okay. All right, so our troops are moving across the stone bridge.
balls forward in the other objectives. Tyler's the one division that's hanging back is 9,500 men. One division that I'm leaving kind of in reserve, if you will. It is about a third, uh, well, not quite a, th eh, a little bit less than a third of our army. Okay. So we'll speed things up a little bit. Still no contact with the enemy. We've seen at least one of the regiments from a distance. I wonder if this would be a game that like I should role play in the sense of like, if I'm playing as McClellan, I should play overly cautious and fight the way I think McClellan would fight. Or if I'm Pope, I would play reckless and ignore my flanks. Or if I'm Hooker, I would be real aggressive at the start and then sort of, you know, delay a little bit and, and lose lose my my focus or something. I don't know. Like I just, it could be interesting to try and role play that a little bit. All right, Tyler, I'm not going to have you cross quite yet, but I'm going to have you move closer to the stone bridge. You can see here the enemy is in a position here near Henry Hill. You can see there's Longstreet's brigade, Ewell's brigade, Jones's brigade. They've also got a bunch of artillery deployed over this way. Almost looks like they're on a reverse slope. I don't think they are, but that's almost the way, like, they're behind the wood line here. I would have thought deploying along this creek, at least on the other side of Stone's Bridge, catching the enemy in a bit of a V on the other side of the river, might be an interesting strategy, but it doesn't appear that they're they're doing anything like that. Meanwhile, we're crossing unmolested across the, the Bull Run Creek here. I'm going to move Heinzelmans' 9,000 men up instantly to engage the enemy. We'll try and hit them on this flank of Henry Hill. They've got three brigades in front of us that we can see, but we'll move up along this ridge line here that the enemy is deployed behind the ridge line. Longstreet appears to be moving up toward the crest of Henry Hill, early moving up to support his flank. Miles is uh, 5,000 men. You're, we're just going to move you instantly on those guns, those exposed guns on that flank. And then Hunter, you're going to move up to, to probe the enemy's center. So you can see the enemy is forming into a nice straight line of battle. It does sound like we're beginning to see some units engaged, some enemy skirmishers here. Bonham's detachment. They are shifting troops south from Henry Hill to meet the threat posed to their flank. By the looks of it, they might actually be refusing their line, moving these guys south to intercept Franklin before he can get into position. My troops are still deploying. Runrin, you're going to deploy to the to the right here to support the flank of Heinzelman as he kind of moves up. Heinzelman appears to be shifting his troops back, pulling Franklin and uh, and Wilcox back. We've lost 37 men so far. So the enemy appears to be shifting their entire line back, however, which is a little bit interesting. I mean, they're moving south to engage Heinzelman, who is exposed. They're moving skirmishers out front of these brigades, and they're preventing being flanked. I'm not sure why Heinzelman is, is riding around like a chicken with his head cut off at this point. He seems to be moving around a lot. He might have steadied himself now. Miles, I'm just going to have you advance on Henry uh, Henry House. Let's give your commander the... Uh, is there a advance option, or where's my... I guess I'm commanding him directly. All right, Tyler, you come across. No point in your 9,000 staying that far out of the fight. Also, McDowell's back there too, so it's going to cause slower orders. So the enemy is moving a whole bunch of skirmishers out front here to engage Heinzelman's division. Runyon is moving his troops to Heinzelman's flank to prevent Jones, Ewell, and Longstreet from getting around it. You can see here we've got... Uh, I'm, go I'm going at times four speed, so I should slow things down a little bit. So you can see a whole bunch of man maneuver and movement. Our troops are using these roads intelligently here to extend their line, get into position. The enemy looks like they're trying to flank Heinzelman. Also, apparently some of our troops are retreating. The first brigade is 
broken? Andrew Porter's brigade is broken from Hunter's division? That's weird. Why? What broke you, sir? All right, McDowell, come on. Come forward and get into the action here. Heinzelman, you're in a quasi-straight line, and you're engaged heavily. Runyon is also uh, moving into position to be engaged, although it looks like Baker's flank might be a little bit in the air. Hunter's two brigades that were advancing up the middle toward Henry House, one of them has been broken with only modest casualties. Okay... Meanwhile, Miles' brigade has lost 80 men engaging, I guess, just the guns. So they're probably eating some canister as they try and close the... Well, they're engaging the guns with musketry. So we'll move move this other brigade up to... Up to the guns. Our own guns are in position here, firing into the flank of these rebel guns. Got Tyler's division of 9,000 coming up here. It's a bit of a cluster. I should have moved Tyler up with the rest of the the rest of the men. Air's battery of artillery is taking its time crossing the ford. I haven't used a lot of their ammo yet. Volunteer brigade here. Move forward here to engage these rebs in the open. This second division of artillery is losing quite a few men. Second brigade under Burnside is is a pretty good sized brigade, about a thousand men. Meanwhile, Tyler's brigade is is or division is coming up here, so that'll reinforce the center. And should stabilize things, I would think. But the enemy has a pretty strong position here. We'll see if we can we can dislodge them from it. got troops up over their other flank but we've got to take out this artillery which is has got some of our infantry in a in an open open field here and is hitting them pretty hard the second brigade's lost 300 men the first brigade has not so let's move these guys up a little bit closer to these guns behind this fence or sort of point blank fire into them washington's artillery battery has only lost 18, 18 casualties are you kidding I mean, I guess I'd say charge, boys. Try and make... Oh, you did drive off one of those batteries. So you can see, actually, they must have lost a lot more. Those casualties must have been estimates. Because there's a lot of dead bodies on the ground here. Tyler's Brigade is still coming up. And uh, we're up over the flank. Miles' division is up over the flank of the enemy here toward Henry Hill. Once this, this battery of artillery is pushed back, we'll move south to engage the 8th Brigade here, which is sort of the one rebel unit in their rear. 2nd Brigade is kind of engaged with them. We'll move them forward a little bit as well into this wood line here. They, sh they should have some cover. The bulk of the fighting seems to be on Heinzelman's front. He doesn't have much artillery. I didn't didn't do a good job of getting Heinzelman up. Runyon's division is also engaged, but the bulk of it seems to be on Heinzelman's front. He's lost about 400 men out of his 9,000. He's got three brigades, four brigades, uh, actually three brigades firmly engaged here against four or so rebel brigades. We've got our troops mostly in good cover, although the enemy is in a, is in a tree line there as well. Meanwhile, Tyler's 9,000 should be the decisive factor. The fact that there's no rebel reinforcements coming up, you know, a la, a la, oh shit.
don't do that. I still had Heinzelman selected. All right, let's move Dixon Miles Brigade up. So continue to close that line. Tyler's troops may only come up in time to pursue. Although uh, Hunter's division has has lost some casualties here. Tyler's brigade, are they engaged with Jones? It says they've lost nothing. Is this just a detachment? No, it says it's the third rebel brigade. I think they're trying to charge me. Maybe they're not returning fire and we're just firing volleys into them. They appear to be moving directly into our lines. Not sure why they would have charged rather than try and lay down volley fire. We do hear the rebel yell here as the 3rd Brigade charge, charges into our position. I'm assuming Tyler will hold, but we'll see. Looks like Jones and jo both enemy brigades... Oh, that was quick. Whoa, did they surrender? It says a major federal victory. The enemy lost 17, oh no, 1,700 of 19,000 troops. That's weird that it just like auto ends and doesn't, they don't have to retreat or anything. So we lost 1,200 casualties out of 32,000. They lost 1,700 out of 19,000. So they still have the bulk of their army in, in good shape here. Um, they did lose all 30 of their guns. That might've been a, a decisive factor here. But yeah, that was a little bit jarring in how the battle just sort of ended. If we take a look at the battlefield here, we can see sort of it's 8 in the morning. So the first morning of the first major battle, the Battle of Alexandria, and the Confederates are crushed. If we take a look at the dispatchers, Heinzelman in contact, Miles in contact. Hunter's division was demoralized. Uh, but other than that, yeah, I guess, I guess I'll take the victory, but... That was a little bit jarring, a little bit confusing. We'll see how things shake out, though. Now that the enemy is presumably going to be driven into retreat, we'll continue the advance on Richmond and see if we can't uh, press the issue. Our own losses amount to 1,289 men. The enemy is believed to have lost 1,700. The enemy national morale drops by 0.75%, while our military experience rises by 0.38. Due to his battle honors, Colonel Tyler has become famous and an inspiration for his men. Okay, glorious victory at Alexandria. The Army of the Potomac is fleeing in panic. Colonel Tyler becomes a national hero. So he was the commander of that brigade that had... Uh, had the enemy charging it. Support for the rebel cause wavers. Federal troops triumph. His Excellency the President, the Battle of Alexandria has ended with the Army of the Potomac retreating in panic. My command has earned a total victory with the enemy army running for their lives. The enemy has reportedly suffered a total casualties of 1,745 men, of the, uh, thereof 318 killed and zero captured. The morale is believed to be stable. Our own casualties are 1,289 men with 394 killed, so we actually lost more men killed. Uh, 113 men missing and the rest are wounded. Morale is confident with the supply situation mediocre. We've captured 305 and 8 from the battlefield. I don't know what that last line means. 305 what and 8 of what? 8 artillery pieces maybe? 305 men? I don't know. So we'll go ahead and pause, or we are paused. So you can see here the Army of Northeastern Virginia. Supplies are at 0%, so I don't know if that means I've got to got to pause here in Virginia to wait for supplies to catch up, if the enemy's going to retreat further south. If they do retreat, the Army of the Shenandoah might be in a difficult spot, but the Army of the Pennsylvania up here in the north really has not made much progress. It almost looks like they've even stopped marching. Claims their supplies are 0 too, so maybe they should stop marching. But that's a victory. British intervention is 44%. 
Confederate Invasions 1, the Missouri State Guard, 5,200 men there in Missouri. The Union Invasions 3, the Army of Northeastern Virginia, the West Virginia Militia, and the Army of Occupation, 7195. The Army of Occupation? Where's that? Okay, that's the West Virginia Militia. The Army of Occupation is George B. McClellan's army in Western Virginia. They also have zero supply. I would think they would start drawing supply from somewhere if there's no Rebs to interdict it. I don't know if we need to clear the railway south on the Shenandoah so they can transport to the Army of Occupation. I'm not sure. We'll have to see. But that'll all be figured out next time. Until next time, this is the Historical Gamer saying once again, welcome back to Grand Tactician, the Civil War, a game currently in early access on Steam uh, that is being developed uh, that hopes to provide both grand strategy and tactical level combat uh, in the American Civil War. Uh, and, and we'll figure out how our Union campaign continues next time. Until then, this is the Historical Gamer saying once again, thank you very much for watching. And until next time, I'm out.